Welcome to Commissioner Tools Orientation. This session is geared toward commissioners and professionals. I'd like to start by introducing the players that will be on today's webinar. Myself, Rick Helen Brand, also Deborah Kendrew, the Program Manager for Commissioner Tools, along with Bob Hoffmeyer, Central Region Area 6 Assistant Area Commissioner, who has been our training lead for the Commissioner Tools effort. Hey, Rick, why don't you tell us why we're on this webinar today? What's our purpose? Well, thanks, Bob. It is a good idea to have a reason for being here. Our reason is to discuss the role of you as a commissioner of professional and commissioner tools and the unit service plan and how they work together. The presentation is targeted to all commissioners and unit serving professionals since our primary role jointly is unit service. In other words, we'll be focusing mostly on those commissioners and professionals who primarily interact directly with units. We will, however, not ignore administrative commissioners such as ADCs, RTCs, and district commissioners. Now, the tool is a means to an end. It is not the end itself. While we will not review the unit service plan in detail today, you need to have a basic understanding of the unit service plan to better understand how commissioner tools is a means to better commissioner unit service. Rick, why don't you give us a little bit about a of the background of what, what Commissioner Tools are about, please. Well, thanks for asking that question, Bob. We began this process actually in September of 2013 and put together a focus group with commissioners from around the country representing all four regions and across all levels, from unit commissioners all the way to the National Commissioner Support staff. And uh, in that process, we started with a clean sheet of paper and said, what do we need to do as a commissioner to better do my job? And where's the requirement? Not just nice to haves, but what says I need to do this? Um, if you recall, the unit visitation tracking system was deployed many years ago. In fact, it was deployed about the same time as the initial iPhone. So if you uh, keep, are keeping up with current events, you'll note that technology has advanced so much that the iPhone 6 has been released. And BSA needs to update our technology as well. So that led to the, the background, and it then leads to the next logical question, which is, why should I use Commissioner Tools? Now, Commissioner Tools was developed to enable commissioners to provide better unit service quicker and more efficiently, while retaining the data from UVTS. Now, UVTS will no longer be available to councils once they convert to commissioner tools. So the mission of unit service is to help units better serve more youth through scouting. And to accomplish that, commissioners must accomplish four objectives. They need to support unit growth through the journey to excellence. They need to contact units and capture their strengths and needs in commissioner tools. They need to link the unit needs for assistance to district operating committee resources based on where the unit's needs are and how to make them stronger. And they need to support timely charter renewal. So Commissioner Tools was designed to help commissioners fulfill their mission by providing benefits in four areas. First, enabling easy access to actionable information. Second, enabling improved focus on their primary objectives. Third, supporting roundtable administration and promotion. And fourth, supporting commissioner administration itself. Thanks, Rick. How about if you give us a little bit of an explanation of what is a significant visit versus a contact? OK. Well, actually, we're not going to use the word visit anymore. We're going to call our efforts contacts, because we recognize not all of those actionable um, sessions occur in a face-to-face meeting. It could occur via emails, a series of emails, or an extended long phone call, or even something like this webinar. So uh, that is considered to be a contact. Now, the difference between a significant contact and just a plain old contact would be, and I like to use the Home Depot example, is if I see the scoutmaster for the unit that I'm the unit commissioner for in Home Depot, we bump into each other and we exchange pleasantries, how's the family, and all the rest of that. That's not a significant contact. That doesn't need to be logged. If, on the other hand, 
you have that bumped into your scoutmaster in Home Depot occasion, and he says, hey, I got something going on in the unit. You got a few minutes to sit down and grab a cup of coffee, and you spend 20 minutes talking about how to solve uh, a situation with maybe uh, uh, something going on in the unit, that could become a significant contact. It's something that results in the identification of an actionable need. All right, so Bob, I'm going to turn the tables. I'm going to ask you a question. I need some help. What resources are available out there? Well, we've actually tried to make a lot of resources available to help implement this as we transition. The first one that we have that, that we've created and asked your councils to make is a position we call the council, uh, excuse me, the commissioner tools champion role there in your council. This person is going to be the point of contact when you have a question or a concern or a need. So many of the simple issues that come up are able to be addressed locally, very quickly, very simply, and resolved in a manner much faster than we would be able to if we were trying to support it from a national level. So some councils have so many districts that they actually have some that are very large still. Sometimes these districts have actually considered also implementing what is basically a mere reflection of this council champion into the district level. The, the, the uh, position description for the council champion is available on the website, which you see up on the, the screen now. And you can easily take those that document and convert that to a district champion position if you need. The important thing is that you implement and support it in a manner that's going to be effective. We've also committed uh, or created a area champion position that will support each of the councils. We also, uh, as you can see here on the website, have a number of other documents that are available that, that can help us and help you as you go through this. There's a lot of documents there. Go ahead. I was going to say, this is all for me, and I see a lot of stuff there. Um, one of the things I absolutely need to look at to help me get going with Commissioner Tools most quickly, because I don't have the time to plow through all this. Yeah, there, there's a lot of documents, a lot of information there. You can obviously look at all of them if you choose. Um, these are all of them are geared for different levels of uh, working with Commissioner Tools, but the ones that just that we're talking about today will be the frequently asked questions, which is available right there. Uh, Deborah just pulled that up on the screen. This is a document that's updated on a regular basis, as all of them are. This covers eight general areas. Many of the questions that we get and accumulate, we put into this document and answer as well as we can. And it's, as we call it, a live document, meaning when things go uh, stale, we take them out. When we have new questions that pop up, we put those in. So the frequently asked questions is a great place for you to go to start with. That's about a seven or eight page document. And as I said, it's frequently updated also. Uh, the next one that we've got that you probably want to pay attention to is the acronyms and definitions. This is an important one because we're starting to introduce new words like assessments, detailed assessments, simple assessments, um, health scores, district scores, health indicators, email saturation, council champions, things like this. There's a lot of new words and, and expressions that we're using, and we want you to understand that. So that's another good one for you to look at also. Hey, Bob, with this, document, yeah. with this document, does it show me what all those symbols mean that Deborah's going to show us later in the demo as well? I don't believe that it does. Those are symbols that as you work through the, the process on the Commissioner Tools, you'll be able to understand fairly intuitively, though. I think if we scroll to the bottom, uh, it might be a new update you're not aware of. I thought they had those symbols in there. Yeah, oh, yeah. All right, I didn't think it had been updated yet, so I am incorrect. They are there. So you'll see all of the different logos and icons and pieces and whatnot that are you will see when you go into the Commissioner Tools uh, actual website. So thank you, Rick. I appreciate you correcting that. The, um, the next one makes yeah. Go ahead. Did not mean to trip you up. I'm sorry. That's all right. The next document that I want to briefly look at is the Scout Executive Council Commissioner Acceptance Protocols. This is a document that's just been revised very recently. 
and it is down to a one-page document. It should be fairly easy to look at. This is the document that when your council decides it's time to adopt and start making the plans, this is the, we'll call it the official document that starts the process. Your scout executive and council commissioner are responsible for implementation of commissioner tools in your council. So this is their signing off that says, we understand the process, we know what we got to do, we accept the responsibility, we're ready to take this on and move forward and improve commissioning service. So this is the document that gets assigned. Very important in here that we get the email information and the contact name of that council champion so that if we have an update or we need to share information, we know who to go to. So this is a very important document that some of you may not work with, but this will be the document that all scout executives and council commissioners will work with at one point or another to get your council actually launched off into acceptance of it. Now, I want to go back and reiterate again that please continue to go back to the website, look at it. There's always updates coming on. And if you can remember to look, when you're on the website, there will always be the date, for instance, where it says first step to adopt commissioner tools. Next to that is the date, 8-12-2014. So that was updated uh, not too awful long ago. So as these are updated, look at those dates, pay attention. That will give you the idea of what the most current document is. So Rick, why don't you give us a moment, a bit about how do we stay plugged into what the current state is of affairs? I appreciate that, Bob. I think uh, in this day and age, most of us are connected one way or another to social media. Uh, there is an official social media outlet that the Boy Scouts have for our commissioners on Facebook. And the official Facebook page is listed there on screen right now and is Commissioners of the Boy Scouts of America. That's where official information will come out. Uh, additionally, there are other social media sites available, but they tend to be uh, run by other individuals. They're good places, such as LinkedIn and uh, Yahoo groups, et cetera, but uh, they're not the official site. Uh, so anything that's going to be coming out officially, go to that official Facebook page, and that's where to find that. So. Um, you know, this is one training opportunity that we're doing right now. Uh, Deborah, are there any other commissioner tools orientation opportunities, and how do I find out about those? Yes, actually, we have those posted, and there are several places that you can find out about those. On the Legacy My Scouting landing page, on the new My Scouting landing page, and on the commissioner the scouting.org commissioner web page. On the commissioner web page, you would click the link for unit service plan and commissioner tools, and that will bring you directly to that commissioner page that I was showing earlier. So I think enough slides. Um, let's get in and show the tools. What do you say, guys? Well, I'm getting bored with this. I want to see how this thing works. So. If you have ever used the My Scouting tools, you'll know that when you first get in, this is your landing page. And you click the Home button, and then you get the drop down of your menu. In this case, I am going to click on the Council, and that is my highest natural context or the organization structure in which I'm going to enter the tools from. And I will go directly to click on Commissioner Tools. And again, um, the four tabs, the Units, Roundtable, Commissioner Profile, and Discussion tabs are across the top. And I'm going to drill down into a unit. When you first get into the tools, your dashboard will be fairly empty. Uh, and you will see that you're going to start to build out that dashboard by building your unit contacts or unit assessments. So in this case, uh, we're looking at this dashboard, and we can see that um, there are already contacts built, which because it is a detailed assessment, meaning there's no uh, indicator here that shows me it's a simple assessment, that has completed this health indicator section on my dashboard. And notice that the four indicators that we are looking at 
correspond to the unit service plan indicators, finance, membership, program, and leadership. Also on the dashboard shows who the current commissioner is assigned to this unit. The resources tab pulls in who are the, the key three at the area above where we are. In other words, in this case, it's at the district level, the key three. When I click on archive contact, that brings in all the UVTS entries that were made for this particular unit. You can click on one of these entries, and if there's detail there in, in the UVTS visit, then it would pull up that detail. And there's what the detail looks like. And then finally, the new contact, which is what we want to do to start out. So you have two means of doing an assessment or a contact. Both terms are interchangeable. The simple assessment lets you enter a contact um, very quickly by entering a score of a value of 1 being the lowest and 5 being the highest, so a score, and then you would make comments about your particular contact. How long would it take to make this contact? Probably about 90 seconds or less. Obviously, dependent on how, how lengthy your comments are. Right. So now I entered that particular contact as a simple assessment, and now you can see it has this tilde on it. And what that's done is you can see because it's a simple assessment, um, it no longer has those detailed health indicators here on my dashboard. Now if I'm going to go in and create this as a detailed assessment, and perhaps while I'm doing, um, starting that, Rick, you could tell them, when would you recommend they create a detailed assessment versus a simple assessment? I'll do that. Um, a detailed assessment replaces conceptually the semi-annual unit health assessments that we used to do. Uh, for JTE purposes in 2015, Councils will be expected to conduct at least one detailed assessment. Now, it's going to be up to your individual council whether initially your council commissioner is going to suggest that you get familiarized with the system and get comfortable with it by just making a couple simple assessments or start off with a good baseline doing a detailed assessment. A detailed assessment, as we'll go through here right now, really allows you to uh, launch and go forward and refer back to it from the simple assessments. So uh, I think if the timing is right, councils will prefer to do a detailed assessment, but there is, there is uh, a benefit to having that simple assessment just to get in there and see, hey, this isn't that hard, is it? Okay, so on the detailed assessment, there's actually six steps involved. The first step is just to review the data that is being pulled in in a real-time situation, a real-time environment from our database concerning training and membership. So it's going to tell you who the leaders are that are not trained for their particular position and who has their youth protection training expired or never taken. It also gives you the membership numbers for this particular unit, how many youth are registered and how many adults are registered. Then we go through those four categories that relate to the unit service plan. And finance, there's actually only one topic under the finance category, and that particular topic is budget. And as you know, when you get into the detailed assessment, the drop downs kind of give you a, a key to what you're measuring. So it gives you a little bit more information than simply a numerical value. And also note that you can actually start to create a unit service plan where in each of these sections you can enter action needed, who's the person that's accountable for that particular topic or addressing that area that needs the improvement, and then target dates on when they're going to make those changes.
when I go into membership, you'll see that there's actually several topics that we're going to be evaluating the unit on. Retention. And in each one of these, you can enter detailed comments, which we recommend. Building Cub Scouting. And again, each program is going to differ a little bit in what you're measuring. Annual recharter process, do they do it in a timely manner? Do they have a Weeblos to Scout transition plan? And again, this is the area where if there's particular areas of concern under membership, you want to know what action is being taken and who is accountable for it. So this aligns very closely with building the unit service plan and really identifying those areas where you can assist the unit in building them and creating a stronger resource uh, linkage for resources to bring in help where needed. Then I'm going to go through program. Again, several topics under program. Well, but do I have to do each and every one of these questions, or is there an intermediate approach along the way? Well, that's a good question. And you notice at the very top, if you are going through the detail, it, it basically populates this term calculated. But if you wanted to, you could say, I've already done this detail perhaps a month or two ago, and now I know that under program they're doing fairly well. I can just give them the 3.5 rating and then go and click done at the bottom. Oh, okay. So I don't have to go to uh, the you know, lengthy process through a detailed assessment if I want to put more detail than a simple assessment by particular uh, unit service plan areas, but uh, keep it relatively short. Right. And you could just do that simple single score on that category and enter your comments at the top. And then I could say done on that and it will automatically populate now an overall assessment score. We have one final step in this process and that is to basically determine what we feel the unit is striving to achieve. So we'll say they're striving to achieve goals. That's the only required field that's needed. But then there's a number of areas here where you can make notes and start to uh, create more information for yourself as follow-up, which will then actually a number of these fields will appear on reporting for you within the tools, especially when we get into this priority needs section. There's also one area where if there's a unit candidate, a unit commissioner candidate you want to identify, you could fill this in here with a, a contact information. And then again, this priority needs, if I click any of those off, they're going to show up in a in a report later. What's the attendance thing? This is actually where we're measuring from a, a, really we've got a lot of feedback from people about, well, perhaps trying to keep track of detail att attendance where I'm saying there were 15 boys at the meeting or there were 80 boys at the meeting. It's kind of hard to measure when it's a huge unit and I'm going to visit them on a regular basis. But you can kind of tell whether their attendance is increasing, steady, or decreasing. Well, it looks like you've got flexibility. If you really wanted to count exact numbers, you could put it in the comments somewhere that there were 16 boys this week and 17 last week and whatever. Correct. The comments are uh, very broad areas for you to be able to track from a commissioner's perspective how you best can measure the unit health and track them on an ongoing basis. I thought I didn't have to do this myself. Could somebody else make this entry for me? Oh, that's a very good question. First, let me go ahead and I'm going to close this entry out. And I should have covered that at the beginning when I said we're going to create a new contact. 
So I'm going to go back in and I'm going to say create a new contact. And there are actually four topics or categories that uh, I need to fill out initially. And uh, those are all required fields on this very first page. Um, each one of those has a drop down which you can open and change what's the uh, default. And the default is actually you who are logged into the system. But you can select any commissioner from your council who you are doing this contact entry for. So in other words, we'll say that the visitor was actually Ann, but I am entering this as someone else for Ann. Also note that I was entering those as today's date. You can go back in the system, Rick, and you can enter this up to 60 days. But anything prior to that, it's going to blank out and not let me enter it. That sounds fair enough. So if I make an entry and I'm a professional, will this count for JTE purposes? No, it won't. And um, actually, we have a choice down at the very bottom that's a general professional. So as a commissioner, you could even enter it for a professional. But if the professional is the one that is making the contact, that because of JTE requirements will not be counted. But if a professional were to make the entry and put Ann's name there as an example, it would count, right? It would definitely count. Thank this you. is a good time to show you also how you would end up creating a future uh, assessment. So you could go ahead and you could say, uh, perhaps I'm planning to go out and meet with the unit. So what is the difference now between what was called a self-assessment, Bob, and what we're calling a unit assessment? Well, the difference is going to be that a self-assessment was something that they would do our, themselves, and a unit assessment is something that we can do in conjunction with a commissioner or with the unit themselves actually completing this as a method to try to help themselves with their continuous improvement program. So here what we're doing, and this happens to be a test system I'm using, so there's no emails here, but uh, ordinarily in production, you would hope that you have the emails for the key three, and you can determine with this unit uh, who is going to get this particular email. Uh, if there turns out in some cases where you maybe don't have an email address that's pre-populated in the system, then you can enter an email address here of who you want to make sure gets this particular uh, communication. Now the other thing to point out is that you as a commissioner will be blind copied on any of these contact emails that you're sending out. So then you say send unit assessment. And what it's going to do at that point is it's going to schedule a unit assessment for you. Now I'm going to close out of this particular contact. I'm going to go over to my email. And actually, I've gone ahead and I've sent a previous one so as a sample just to show you. You would get into your email and open the assessment. And then it's going to look, this email that goes to the key three is going to look exactly like this. And they're going to say, click here to view their information. They then do not need to log into anything. It's going to automatically populate for them in a form that they're going to fill out. And it's going to then, within, and, a, and actually the new one that I just sent has just come into my email box. But um, it's going to populate for them this form in the tool that the commissioner, you the commissioner, will then have access to be able to go in and see what they entered. So uh, it's going to basically, I'll show you in a minute how it's going to notify them that they've completed that. So I click on this open unit assessment. And it's going to give me those four categories that you saw previously, finance, membership, program, leadership, and governance. I click on each one of those and 
it's going to end up showing me that this is completed. So what's going to end up happening is if you have multiple folks that you sent this communication to in the unit and one of them has completed it, then when the second one comes back in and looks at this, all of these topics here, these uh, indicators of status, would have a completed next to them. So they're going to go in and they're going to make their comments and they're going to rate themselves in each one of these sections. And just for the and this is where they specifically need to fill in each individual area rather than just one general overall assessment compared to what we are able to do as a commission. Exactly. Let me go ahead and change that to done. So just for the sake of uh, expediency, I will go ahead and say I completed the contact. Of course, we'd want them to go through all of those sections. Then when they come back into the tool, and because I had previously scheduled this, uh, I'm going to end up showing you that you, what, you won't exactly see what they will see. But in this detailed assessment now, what would happen is it would say uh, unit completed here, if it was the actual one that I just completed. It would say unit completed. I click on it, and I would open it up, and then when I get into each one of these sections, it would show the completed section that what the person entered for their information here under the commissioner section. It would have a section here for the unit. Okay, I'd like to quickly go over a couple of the other topics. Uh, this is what the commissioner profile looks like. The commissioner profile is actually just a summary of all of the information that you've done in the system. So it shows you what you, contacts you've scheduled, which ones are in progress, and those you've completed. It also will show you if there's any units that are assigned to you. And then if there's units assigned to you that have had contacts, it shows under that particular unit what the health priority was for that particular unit. Also at the top, notice how many units are assigned and how many contacts were made in the last four months. I'm going to click over to Roundtable. Roundtable actually is um, not necessarily something that's tracked for uh, our, an assessment in our journey to excellence, correct? Rick? That's correct. Roundtable and roundtable entries do not count from a JTE perspective. Although you could, as a roundtable commissioner, make a contact as a consequence of a roundtable meeting if you had a significant contact and uh, add that as a second entry, and that would count. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click New Roundtable. And one thing to note is that as with the units, when you were able to use someone else and enter their information as the person who actually did the contact, the same thing happens here. Perhaps you are a person who is just recording this particular roundtable, but there was another person who is the facilitator. You could enter their name as the facilitator. And I'll go back and I'll say that this happened back in October now. Um, here, we allow you to decide which programs were in attendance for that roundtable. And there's different ways. Really, this is kind of flexible in terms of how you want to record this. The last roundtable recorded will show up in the dashboard. So if perhaps you have more than one program attending on the same evening, you might want to record that as a single roundtable. And then what you could do is you could have different people come in and enter their information for their program if there's different facilitators for each of those particular programs. So I'm going to go into the Cub Scouting. 
And uh, Bob, why do we have a different section at the top for, for counting people versus at the bottom? What is the difference? Well, the, excuse me, this top part is the pink area as before is the required where we have a total count of who is there of unit leaders. Then we're able to break it into these other three other areas so we know how many commissioners we have, how many committee members we have, and how many other guests or visitors or speakers, whatever we have. So when all of those, those last three as well as the total unit leaders total up, the top there you see that number is now 25. That's going to give us the total number of everybody that was there. And when we go to the bottom part where we have the attendance, that allows us to put in how many individual units we had so that we're able to pay attention to what units are coming to a round table and what information they're getting. As you can see, Deborah's entering them as one and a half. It's rare to see a person and a half walking to a round table. But that, in that case, there was a person that actually was there on behalf of PAC-6 as well as PAC-88. And they did information and they collected information and they're going to take it back to both PACs. So in that case, they were literally there as a representative of each pack. So you could go down through all of this, and that lets you add up and count how many we had from each unit. And that's going to keep impacting the number of our percentage that you see there with our Cub Scout units that are attending. So with this, we're able to know that half of our units attended Roundtable that night, as well as a specific count of how many visitors, committee members, commissioners, and unit leaders. Bob, why didn't it do the total on the unit leaders for you? Because sometimes the unit leaders may actually be there for different programs or um, things like that. And it's just something that we're going to let each of the districts and councils decide how they want to count it. And we're not quite as worried right now about how many are there. We're just wanting to make sure that each of the units are there and getting the information and the knowledge to gain from Roundtable. And, okay, and I'm so going to add a little bit to what Bob said here. Notice that I put 1.5 for each of those. If we change that and we decide as a council that we're going to count that person two times in the bottom, notice that the percent doesn't change at all. Okay, so answering my question, I guess, it looks like different districts and councils don't count the same way, and I guess it just gives you flexibility on that total unit leader count. Exactly. That's what we try to do is make it flexible, and, unit, and councils can do it. Even within a council, different districts can do it however they feel most represents their particular district. So here again, you would do the same thing for troops. I'm not going to go through and do that detail. Um, and I can leave that one, that particular meeting in progress, assuming that someone else would come in and they would do their, the second part of that troop. But notice that also um, when I go into that open round table and I go back and open one that is in progress, that I do have to enter a meeting note. The meeting notes is a required section. I'm going Deborah, to how, long do I have, how long do I have to make a correction on this if I need to make a correction to the roundtable entry? And I guess I ought to ask the same question about unit entries for a unit contact. Right. So for a roundtable, you actually were allowing you more time with the assumption that you may have multiple roundtable commissioners who need to come in and put in meeting notes or put in their attendance. So we're allowing them to have 60 days to enter their roundtable. But if you've already started a unit contact and you have basically finished a unit contact and said it was completed, then we're giving you 48 hours to go back and make a change to that completed contact. Then after that, it's logged. Why is that that we give them such a limited time, Rick? Well, it turns out that we need to wrap up the end of the month. And if we give you too long to go make those changes, such as uh, changing the score or whether you had a contact at all, you could change history. 
and um, somebody once said that you can't change history. So we, we give you a couple days to get that done, but we wouldn't want you, say, in the middle of, pick a month, say, uh, February, to decide to change the fact that you made visits in December or what the details were. So the last tab that we have out here is called the discussion tab. And actually, the discussion is um, limited to the particular area that you are logged in at and the structure. So in other words, what I was trying to say is that if you, your natural context is you are registered as a unit commissioner in a district, you would come in at the district level and when you post a discussion, everyone in your district would be able to see that discussion. If you are registered at, at the council level, you would come in at the council and then those commissioners who are registered at the council level would be able to see that particular discussion. So if I was a council commissioner and I wrote a discussion at the council level, only the council commissioner and the ACCs would see my messages, right? Exactly. But if I wanted all my district commissioners to see it, I guess I'd have to go to the district level if I was a council commissioner. Right. They would drill down to their district level. So we have yeah, to because this is going to be public. We want to be careful about how we choose our words with this, I would imagine. You know, Bob, you raise a great point. The question was asked recently, and it was a thoughtful question about do the unit leaders have the ability to see this information? And the answer is no, they don't, not as a unit leader. But if they're a commissioner or if they become a commissioner, it's possible they could go in and see that information, which goes back to your point. Be factual. Don't, don't be inflammatory. And certainly be willing to uh, see your words again in some other form. Hey, Deborah, you've been adding a lot of stuff here. Do I get anything out of this? Like, um, and I know I'm, I'm being a shill here. Are there any reports? I mean, what's all this doing for us? Well, actually, we do have reports. And the interesting thing about the reports, Bob, is um, there's a number of reports. And we've gotten a lot of feedback about the reports. They're available at the, both the district level and at the council level. And, and it, now, in today's presentation, the reports come up actually in a format that you would perhaps want to export those into an Excel document. But this is an area actually that we've got under development right now, and we're making enhancements to the reports. So uh, hopefully, in the near future, these will become actually a little bit uh, maybe I should say fancier or in a better presentation. Um, so it would not be uh, perhaps needed to do, be doing an export, but more visible from using it on your particular device that you're using rather than having to export. But there's a number of reports available. And that's one thing that we really concentrated on was creating a lot of uh, what I would call administrative information for those commissioners who are trying to manage other commissioners in terms of evaluating where perhaps they have units that need help. This is where we talked about the priority needs report, uh, the commissioner stat report, commissioner activity, and so forth. Thank you. Is there anything else that you think um, we needed to cover uh, in our general session for Commissioner Tools. I think that pretty much covers the general Commissioner Tools section. Yeah, I think it would. Um, I would note that the resources button you pressed on before is always giving you the next level up. So if you're at the district level, it's going to give you the council level resources. If you're at the unit level, it'll give you the district level resources. Um, gosh, if you're uh, at the council level, I guess it will give you the area level. So it, it just keeps going up. So there's so many features that probably a real good approach to this is when your council has access to the commissioner tools is to literally go and explore, hit the buttons, see what it's about. Yeah, we've tried very hard to make this intuitive, which is consistent with the, the current state of the art in, in the IT world. Heck, when you go buy a new 
smartphone or practically anything these days, it doesn't come with the instruction manual anymore. You're expected to go figure it out on your own or go to the internet and uh, cruise around. Um, Deborah, was there another piece there on commissioner administration you wanted to talk about? Because I was curious how you would sign commissioners to those units. You never talked on that piece. Uh, yes, actually, and in this particular person that I'm logged in as, um, they are they are actually not a commissioner administrator. Now let me go see if I can um, change to someone who actually is an administrator, and we can see that. Okay, and while you're doing that, I guess we could tell people that a couple of the other tools that they saw from the landing page for my.scouting included a member manager and a training manager. Did you want to mention those briefly? I think they're available now. Yes, actually, uh, let me go ahead and share again and go back into the tools. Go back here and uh, this allows me to go in as someone else. So let me see if I can change to another person in our test system. So the access to these tools is all going to be found under that home button, right? Right. There it's going to be go. found here. So I see the training manager, oops, I did, and the member manager there. Yeah, actually, it's not cooperating and changing to another person for me. So um, let me go ahead and just briefly show you that the training manager and the member manager appear here, as well as in this drop down, you would have a commissioner administration. Okay, and through that commissioner administration, we see a similar form as we did under the commissioner tools, and that's where you can assign a commissioner and uh, units to that commissioner. And I saw that you, in your example, had multiple commissioners assigned in one case. I guess that's also how you would uh, unassign commissioners, too. Yeah, let me just get in here, and I'll show you in one minute. So we're able to assign commissioners there and unassign them so that we can put them under someone else, as well as we're able to, if I recall correctly, pay attention to which commissioners are actually out making those contacts and entries. So this is an administrative commissioner area. Which means unit commissioners and assistant roundtable commissioners are not going to see that in their pull down just as Deborah has been demonstrating here. But if you're an assistant district commissioner, a roundtable commissioner, any other type of commissioner, you'll see this commissioner administration tab that Deborah's now into. Yes, so I've logged in now at the district again for another, uh, selected a different commissioner, and I'm logged in as a district commissioner here, and I can select a commissioner by clicking on him. And then right here on the right side, I say assign unit. I go down and I select what unit I want to assign. Notice there's already one person assigned to this unit. I can assign multiple commissioners to, to a unit. And then when I go over to what assigned units, it shows that he then has that last unit I just assigned to him. 19, that was. Yep. And then I see the unassigned unit, and I guess I see unit health priorities, et cetera. Right. So again, it's similar to what you could see on the person's dashboard, I can simply pick one of these units, say unassign, confirm, and that removes the person. Very good. 
Well, Deborah, thank you for doing this demo here. I think for the benefit of our audiences that they need to uh, appreciate in the summary that all of our commissioner tools, uh, the benefits are available there for both district and council commissioned uh, professionals. And uh, I would encourage every one of them to become familiar with its use and uh, how to support the volunteers more effectively. Uh, simply stated, as we've said before, Commissioner Tools is a better way to improve retention rate of traditional units. It supports the implementation of the unit service plan through detailed assessments of an increased number of significant unit contacts and improves performance ratings of units for the journey to excellence metrics. So, um, Bob, what are we supposed to do right now? What, what can I do now? Well, there's a couple of things we, you can do and you can, we can all benefit from, even prior to your council adopting the new commissioner tools. The first one would be to go into your, uh, your legacy My Scouting account and making sure that you do indeed have your information updated there because that's going to be very important as we saw with the email, the information that Deborah had. That's going to be one big one. The next big one would be that you want to be sure you're talking to your council commissioners, your district commissioners, your champions, whatever you have available, and talking to them and asking about when they're going to be going live, as well as paying attention to the social media to make sure what's going on and, and what's up. We're, we're well into adoption, but we still have some councils that are still not to, perhaps up to speed as much as we'd like. And then certainly pay attention to the local training that's going to be available from your council champion. That's probably the biggest thing you can do right now to get started. Thanks, Bob. So recognizing that we've already addressed some of these questions, but also knowing that repetition perhaps helps us in retention, uh, let's ask a couple more questions again, just so we're certain about the answers. Bob, when's my council going to get commissioner tools, and who makes that decision? Well, the decision to adopt commissioner tools is made between your scout executive and your council commissioner. They are the two people responsible for it. So you will have access to commissioner tools after your council has decided that they want to, in fact, adopt and move into commissioner tools. And when they do that, we will we'll gain that information from that Scout Executive Council Commissioner adoption form that we talked about. So when it's available is really largely based upon when your council decides it's ready to do it, but there is a March 1st uh, absolute drop dead date that all councils must be switched over by. So Bob, what can I do as a district commissioner or an assistant district commissioner, perhaps I'm a round table commissioner or a unit commissioner to move my council forward? Well, I would say definitely the number one thing you could do is speak up the chain of command, we'll say. If you're a unit commissioner or a roundtable commissioner, go to your district commissioner. If you're a district commissioner, go to your round to your council commissioner or your assistant council commissioners and start the conversation of where are we gonna when are we gonna start doing this and what's going on, when can we start the adoption process? So where do I go for assistance again, Bob? Well, by far, the best place for you to go for assistance is to stay local inside of your council. The, the district, if you've adopted the idea of having a district champion, go to your district champion. If you've not, uh, then by all means, please go to your council champion. If, if you still need more assistance and that's not available, the, there's assistance available at the area level and uh, from your professionals also. They should be having information about all of this. So Bob, how do I verify that I have a my.scouting.org account? Well, you, like I said, you're going to want to go into that legacy, the my scouting, not the dot, the my scouting. Sign in and make sure that your member number is in fact entered in there and that the number that you're entered as a commissioner as is actually the primary number so that they can be sure that your access is granted properly. When you update that, it's going to take probably 20 to 30 minutes or so, and you'll, your account then will be activated at my.scouting, and you'll have access to commissioner tools once your council adopts. Thanks, Bob. If you don't mind, would you just go over one more time, what is the difference between 
when I enter a simple assessment and when would I enter a detailed assessment? Okay. A detailed assessment is going to be entered uh, for JTE purposes next year. We're asking for one, but ideally it would be best if it was entered at least twice a year or when there's a change of leadership or other situation where it calls for the need at the unit level. That, that the detailed assessment is going to essentially let you develop the plan and the concept of what actions are needed to support that and tie that linkages back to the district committee for the support. In between those six month terms or times where you've done those detailed assessments, we can now use the simple assessment as a means to keep touching base and saying, this is what the unit has worked on, this is what they've identified, this is the progress that they're making to fix or improve the things that are going on in that unit. So it's, uh, it's a difference between how we create the plan with the detailed assessments or identify the information to create the plan. And the simple assessment is the updates, the frequent updates of how we're supporting that plan. Thanks, Bob. I think you've covered all the topics we wanted to cover tonight. Okay. Well, I think that uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. On behalf of the entire commissioner's focus group, everybody that's been involved with it, thank you all for your time and for everything you do for scouting in your communities. We appreciate that you're ready to start adopting commissioner tools and trying to improve commissioning service in your local councils. So we'll see you around the fire. Thank you all for coming.